Welcome to A Drink of Wisdom with Jay Wise and Nathan Drinkard. I'm your host, Cody Ward. Thanks for spending some of your time with us tonight. As a reminder to all our listeners, besides being on all your favorite podcast platforms, A Drink of Wisdom is also on YouTube with each so segment available. Head on over, and if you like what you hear, then we'd appreciate your subscription. What's going on, guys? Good to be back. How's it going? Yeah, I know everybody might feel a little bit, you know, down, sad, because the last dance is old, but hey, never fear, because we are here. It's the drink, it's the beer, and it's the wisdom. Let's do it. Yeah, you heard the man. Let's talk some sports, baby. Let's roll, baby. I missed that. In episode 72, we're going to tell you which NBA dynasty deserves their next documentary, what's up with the Rooney rule in the NFL, and which quarterback is under the most pressure in 2020. We've got the answers to those questions and more coming right up. But first, ESPN's 10-part documentary of Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls did come to a conclusion on Sunday. Episodes 9 and 10 cover the infamous flu game, the backstory of Steve Kerr, and the defeat of the Utah Jazz, both in 97 and 98, to complete their second three-peat in seven years. The docuseries set records for the most viewed documentary ever on TV, and it's really easy to see why. So, Drake, what were your takeaways from the last two episodes, and did the series change your opinion on MJ and the Bulls at all? Uh, well, let me answer the first, first, I mean, the second end of that question first. Uh, no, it didn't. It gave me some insight, but at the end of the day, if, if I, I came into this series thinking the, Bull, the Bulls was one of the best dynasties in the NBA, and they still was one of the best dynasties in the NBA. I came here thinking Jordan was the GOAT, and he still was considered the GOAT. So at the end of the day, the, all the documentary did was it told me some things I didn't know about the team that it did do, but it, it didn't change my mind. I, if anything, it helped myself. It helped my wife. My wife is part of the, I would say, a younger generation. And she got to see some things that she might not know about it that she was impressed with. So I thought the documentary did well as far as um, highlighting uh, Michael Jordan and the Bulls. Now to, to my takeaways, the first one is the flu, I mean, the food poison game, you know. Um, listen, for the longest, I was under the impression that it was the flu. And then Michael Jordan hit me with the two-piece. Um, and he didn't hesitate with it. You, you heard him. He said, uh, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't no flu. Hey, I'm going to tell you what happened. Sit back. Have a drink. So, uh, you know, and he goes on and he, you know, he was hungry. They they went around Utah. They, they you know, before game five of the 1997 series, and they go around and they ask, you know, try to get him something to eat. It's one place open. They And it, it seems that as if his trainer was trying to say they did this on purpose. He didn't say that. But he said he found it very odd that it was nowhere open but this one piece of place. And then when it, once they, you know, call in the order, five guys show up with one piece of – well, what was y'all holding? His belt? Like, uh, what, what, five guys, what, what, what are we delivering? Are we doing the condominiums separate? Do we got a, a slice per person? Like, what are we doing here? So five guys showing up. They over here, paparazzi special, TMZ special. They trying to get, it, get a peek in. Hey, 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 we know Michael Jordan in there. Hey, 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 open this door. You know, all this extra stuff, you know, and, and his, his trainer set the pizza down and he said, listen, I don't, I don't, feel, I don't feel good about this. There's something about this that's not right. He probably didn't think that, you know, some fans, because I don't think that Utah Jazz organization had anything to do with it, but some fans would take it that far to, like, po try to poison someone. But at the end of the day, they wasn't 100 percent they wasn't 100% sure that this pizza was going to Michael Jordan. It could have went to uh, Steve Kerr. Like, who knows who this pizza was going to. So I think you can reach and make your assumptions. Either way, he did get food poison. He woke up 3 in the morning throwing up left and right, you know, weak. Uh, they had to hook him up to IVs every chance they got. They wasn't sure he was going to play. But listen, this is – it was games like this while Michael Jordan was Michael Jordan. He said, I don't give a rip how sick I am. Hook your ball up to an IB. I'm going to be on the court. You could miss me with the bull crap. I don't care if people got to carry me up and down the court. I'm going to play. And that's what he did. He dropped 38. And I thought what was very interesting about this was the interview where they showed um, – they, they was talking to Sloan, Jerry Sloan, after the game. And it was like, hey, <laughs> did you know Michael was sick? He was sick? No. He was sick. He looked sick to you. Did he look sick to you? I, I didn't notice he was sick. You know, I got a kick out of that because I would have responded the same exact way. Like, he was sick? Is that what you call sick? 
Well, that dude better on his sick days than I am when I'm 100% healthy. Like, it, it is what it is. So I got a kick out of that. Uh, I'm pretty sure Michael never ate another piece of food out of Utah again. That very next year, he probably had everything flown in on, on the team plane. Uh, he didn't trust it. I don't blame him. So I think it's very interesting because we, we thought that it was the flu game. But I, I really don't care what game you call it. The fact was he was sick and he dropped 38, and it is what it is. That dude is a bad – I mean, think about how good you got to be. He was the best player in the world while he had food for him. Some people just got it, and some people just don't. Then part two, um, the Rotman Runaway part two. Mr. I got to take a break whenever I got to take it. This dude here, I'm telling you right now, he got a 30 for 30 out, but it was no, his 30 for 30 is nowhere as good as the crap he pulled in this Bulls 30 for 30. Let me tell you that right now. This dude is old 30 for 30, but some of the crap. I'm talking, how do you play a game in the finals and then decide, I ain't going to go to break. And then don't even, don't tell anyone. Don't tell Phil, don't tell like that. And then the next time they see you, hey, hey, what did he say? Oh, he didn't show up, boss. Oh, God, dog, let me get him on the phone. WCW Nitro. You got you to got Hulk Hogan come out there. You know what I mean? Do his thing. And he, he points over. It is, it's Dennis Robbie. Could you imagine? You're at home getting ready for the NBA Finals, and you look and you see your teammate coming out on WCW Nitro. You're like, this guy, what? But listen, Rodman, he said what he said. The reason it worked is because Phil knew that I was a special type of guy. He understood me. He knew I needed mental breaks. He knew I needed to do whatever I had to do off the court to help me perform 100% on the court. He Phil knew this. This is why when I say coaching matters, this is what we mean by coaching matters. It's little stuff like this that we don't pay attention to. Not every coach would have been able to handle that. But Phil knew what who Dennis Rodman was. He knew why he had Dennis Rodman there. And listen, at the end of the day, as wild as that was, he only missed one practice. It wasn't like he was absent for a game. He missed the one practice. He came back. Phil handled it how he handled it. And he went on to play a very good rest of the series. But listen, that Dennis Rodman was off the chain. That dude, that boy, he was something else. He was, he was. How you just? I oh, don't know. You in the NBA Finals, man, and then you showed up on WCW Nitro having beers with Hulk Hogan. Outrageous. And then my third takeaway is always the what if. What if? What if Michael Jordan said, if if the management had not came out before the season and said, it's pretty much over. If Phil go 82 and no, it ain't happening. Um, we're not re-signing Sky. All this stuff they said, right? What if they had not said that and he was able to sell these guys on one more year? What if? They could have won seven. Seven is always better than six at the end of the day. What if we could have made that happen? And like we was talking about before the show, you know, what if? The, the big what if, I, 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 love, I love the fact that we got the what if. Because now you got people like LeBron out here chasing a ghost. Like, what if he had came back and won seven? What if he never retired the first time and they just would have went straight through? Like, they would have went from 91 to 98 straight to the... We don't know. That's why the what if is so great. Um, you know, it's, you can find arguments for both ways. If he had a state, if the team had a comeback, it was a very good chance they could have won in 1999. Now, we do have to remember that was the, the beginning of the Spurs dynasty. So would they have beaten the Spurs down the line? Maybe. We don't know. Was Jordan still good enough to carry a team over Tim Duncan carrying a team at the time with David Robson? Maybe. We don't know. But we would never know. And that is why the what if is so great. You know, had he not played baseball, would they have won all those years? Hey, I know one person that would have loved if he had not retired, Scotty Pippen, because we wouldn't have had that 1.8 second bit in, inside the documentary, that's for sure, because he wouldn't have had to worry about it. So it's, it's a lot of what else. So, yeah, my, my three was the um, the flu game slash uh, food, food poisoning, you know, uh, the Dennis Rodman, I'm out, part two. And then, you know, what if? What if he had to stay for another year? Yeah, this uh, to the second question, 
uh, the documentary really didn't change my opinion or alter anything. It just kind of reconfirms uh, preconceived notions or beliefs that you already had. Michael's a goat. This was, you can make an argument, this is the greatest dynasty we've ever seen. Probably, and probably the second three Pete is more impressive than the first three. And, but, for, but further down the line, uh, the Pacers part of this story is interesting because Michael said it himself, um, outside of those Piston teams that the, the uh, Bulls had to get through initially to start winning titles. Uh, I said, this was the toughest team uh, that we had to play. And when you look at the totality of the Bulls dynasty, this was one of two times that they got pushed to a seventh game. And when you take, when you actually go back and look at that Pacers team, I mean, they were, they were fairly stacked. Mark Jackson, you know, second uh, most assist all time. Reggie Miller, we know how great he was. Chris Mullen, I mean, this was a guy who was on that 92 Dream Team, so you know he could play. You had Rick Smiths, all seven foot four of them, just doing what he wanted to do inside. Uh, Dale Davis, Antonio Davis, those guys, they were forces on the interior. And then, you know, you throw in Jalen Rose. Man, what a, what a team they had. Oh, and you got, you know, another dude over there on the sidelines who he knew a little bit about some basketball and Larry Bird. So really no, really no surprise. And especially considering the Bulls at this point, it looked like they were starting to, you know, run on fumes with the, you know, the age, attrition, all these other things. And they got, they got tested big time in that series. Um, you know, the Reggie Miller, the game winning shot he had, uh, Larry Bird on the sidelines with a stone face, like, well, yeah, we still got, you know, half a second or so. So plenty of time for Michael to ruin this for us. Almost almost happened. A double clutch uh, from the left wing, almost banked it in. Pacer fans, you know, holding their breath until the very last possible moment just to make sure, okay, okay, now we got it. But, you know, in the end, you still, I'd still be uh, with a stone face after that game because we still got to beat them, what, two or three more times? Probably not going to happen. It didn't happen. But the Jazz series, uh, obviously we know Michael looked for every little bit of slight from the media, from other players to motivate him. And when Carl Malone won that MVP, uh, the, uh, thank you, thank you, uh, NBA voters and writers and everything. Well, you just get, the Bulls got another title right off there because you know Michael won't go let that slide, and he didn't. And the you know, the flu game, I thought it was a fascinating story. Um, that didn't know, I did not know that it was food poisoning. So that was interesting. And it, it did seem a little sketchy, um, the details they was going through. And I believe Jordan's trainer at the, uh, he said in the documentary, yeah, I had a, had a bad feeling about this one, man. And for good reason, but, and, uh, when you look at that game five, it, it got off, uh, Michael got off to a, a slow start. He didn't look like himself. And then there, there was a timeout that occurred at one point and then just, flip the switch and next thing you know he's he's himself and yeah Jer Jerry Sloan had like what two moments in this uh, documentary I thought they were both hilarious like two post-game pressers and it's like yeah he I guess I'm the only dude in the building that didn't know he was sick and I don't even know what y'all talking about he just what 38 yeah I don't know like I guess we're lucky he wasn't healthy because it would have been about 58 or something but and then the what the the 96-54 beat down, I think it was game three, 54 points. I just, I just can't imagine because uh, the Jazz, I mean, they had their own duo that was pretty excellent. I, I, got, I got a little more respect for John Stockton. Like, I, you, I automatically think of John Stockton as just an uh, all-time NBA leader in assists, great passer. He was, there was plenty of highlights out there of him scoring the ball, hitting a big three in one of those games. Um, Speaking of, and speaking of threes, um, I thought the Steve Kerr story was interesting. And uh, it, it makes a lot of sense, and I'm glad they covered it, that when he got to the Bulls, uh, kind of his mentor became John Paxson because they were both similar type players, three-point spot-up shooters. And Steve Kerr, in those last three titles, he became the John Paxson and became a guy Michael could rely on, hit a game-winning shot. and and then going back to the ringmaster of, of it all, and it ties into what you was talking about with Dennis Rodman. I don't think there's another coach that would have been able to handle some of the nonsense with Dennis Rod Rodman. Phil Jackson, 
the the perfect perfect dude to to be in that situation and it goes it depends on how you look at it it, inc- it it's part of coaching or it goes beyond coaching because the first thing we think of with coaching is x's and o, x's and o's offense defense substitution patterns all this type of stuff but the ability to manage different personalities and nothing more different and eccentric that we've seen <laughs> than Dennis Rodman and the way he handled that you know reporters just co- uh, was that was that uh was this absence excuse? No, it wasn't excuse. Or oh, where is he? I don't know. He ain't here. Just I don't know what you want from me. He he just he gone. We'll, f- we'll figure it out. He'll be back. And sure enough, came back. Needed to do his thing. Uh, nothing like I've ever seen before with some of the stuff that he had going on. But and then Scott Scotty Pippen. I think in some in some uh, cases, Scotty looked. At different parts of this documentary, it really portrayed him in a bad light. I think some of it that equals that uh, makes it even is that last game, that game six, when his back was no good, and you could like you could just see it. Everything he went to do, he was laboring. And if you if you had a back injury, the, even the least little thing in your back is is all is debilitating, and you, you could see it with how he was moving up and down the court, but. He gutted it out, and I give him a lot of credit for that. And he made a difference out there, yeah. yeah even I, at that I condition. Too. Yep. And then, and then, last point, which go back to Phil. Phil let him know, based on the conditions that the executive set and the statements they made at the beginning of the season. Hey guys, this is it. This is the last dance. And then you, they win, and it, you know, there's a cloud over like, well, we won. I know, we know what was said, but what about doing it again? And Phil said, well, guys, uh, write, write some stuff out, bring it in, and then, you know, we'll set it on fire, and that'll be it. And, you know, even out there at the championship event in the park, you know, somewhat telling the fans, like, yep, this is it. It's been great. It's been fun. But that's a wrap. Yeah, this uh, this documentary was awesome, man. I really enjoyed watching this uh, because, you know, like you were t- kind of saying, Drink, the younger generation, I mean, late 20s, you know, but I, I didn't really get to see MJ. So, like I said, in the beginning of this, I was really looking forward to the deeper look. And I've always leaned a little bit more towards LeBron because that's who I'd seen play. But th- I wouldn't say this, like, radically changed my opinion. I've still always kind of had the, the opinion that MJ is probably the GOAT. But this really kind of reinforces that you see a lot of those – kind of like goat moments throughout the documentary that really kind of solidify who he was and his legend kind of precedes him and whatnot. But um, yeah, a few things that stood out in the whole, in the last two episodes, you know, some of the funniest clips of this whole thing was just Jordan in the locker room or in practice, just messing around. Like I was legitimately laughing at some of the things he was saying, man, I was having a, I was having a ball. Like, those, those are some of my favorite moments of the whole thing. Uh, the flu game I thought was really interesting. The food poisoning uh, angle, I didn't expect that. I, I just, I always thought it was just the flu. I, didn't, I never thought it was anything more to it. But um, like you said, Jay Pippen, that was that was impressive. Now again, I laughed a lot when he was like, "Yeah, I was a decoy the whole game." I mean, there was there was nothing much to it. And like you said, if you had a back injury, man, there just the fact that he was moving up and down the floor with those guys was impressive. Uh, you can't hardly do anything. So uh, yeah, he he, I feel like he in this whole documentary kind of got. I don't know. I feel like you're, I think you're right. He just didn't get the the spotlight. Maybe he deserved. I don't know if that was on purpose or if it was just the way it kind of looked, but um, I thought he could have been a little more favorably sort of um, shown in this, in this one. But, um, you know, I thought it was interesting. They were talking about MJ's minutes in that last uh, series. You know, they were like, Oh yeah, Jordan's played all but two minutes in the series. And I, I had to help but think. I was like, doesn't LeBron do that every playoff series? Like, isn't that just something we see nowadays? He's still, so many stars just play in the playoffs the whole time. I don't know if that was something Jordan started, but um, it just seemed like it would seem novel at the time. And nowadays it's just kind of expected. Oh, you're the star. Yeah. You're, you're playing 44, 46 minutes. Deal with it. <laughs> you know, but um, I would, and, and to that point, I would just say that, but back then, and it seemed like that was how they approached. And I'm not saying to, to like 45, 46 minutes, but, they went full out in the regular season, night in and night out. Like Michael, even in that last season, the last championship was upwards, you know, to what, 38 minutes a game. And he played, played every night. Whereas now you see some stars, it's more of a, you know, they, that you coast through the regular season. Right. So you have the energy saved up for the playoffs. 
Yeah, that could be that could be it. Um, yeah, I also thought uh, Reggie Miller's comments. You were talking about that squad and how good Indiana was. But I thought that um, you know his his comments at the end of like that their part was interesting, where he said you know he thought they were the better team, that Indiana was a better team rather, but that Jordan's Bulls had that championship DNA, and that's just something we see nowadays. You know, there's just certain teams that have it, and I I, I wouldn't I don't know if I would agree that Indiana was the better team. It was probably very close, but yeah, I, I you look at that series, there was the the Bulls and being there before that pushed them you know over the edge uh, in that series but uh, yeah overall this this documentary really lived up to the hype and I feel like I have a better understanding of the team and who they were and it kind of cut through a lot of the narratives and half truths just cherry pick things you hear without a lot of context um I want to follow up real quick uh I don't have a ton of time but you know if you were in their shoes the drink kind of alluded to this would you have been happy with going out on top uh, we'll start with you, Jay. Would you have been happy on going out on top, winning essentially, you know, six for six uh, when you were fully healthy with your squad? Or would you have rather just, you know, came back and played the lost? Yeah, I, I go back to what um, I think, I believe it was Tim Floyd. He was the, you know, kind of the guy Jerry Krause had lined up to replace Phil Jackson after this season was uh, went down. And even Tim Floyd said, Jerry, don't don't get in the way of this let it die a natural death is what he said. And that's kind of, that's kind of where I'm at. I feel like as a player being, uh, being uh, put myself in the shoes of one, some of the guys on those teams at the top of their game and just dominating the sport, the way they were, I would have liked to continue as long as they could have winning. And then, you know, let's just say they come back one more year and they lose. Okay. Well, we went as far as we can go. Now it's over, but to leave it kind of, just out there, like, what if, like, cause you know, that's, I, I'm, I'm, a, I hate the what ifs, like thinking about, you know, and not only in sports, but all parts of my life. Like, what if I could have done more here? What if I, you know, did I have a little bit more effort and energy that I could have done this better? And that's why, and you can tell like, but one of the great things about Michael is he lived it. He lived in the moment. You know, when when he's, uh, he's, you know, out there playing around on the piano and people are asking him about, you know, what about next year? What about nothing? Like, uh, let's just enjoy this right now. But at the end of the day, I would if I was a player on those teams, I would have liked to continue as long as I could have and just lose, like, let it happen in front of me. Like, let the let somebody else prove to me that they can beat me and they can beat us. Don't don't let, you know, executives get in the way of that. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Jay point is understandable, but you know, I'm I'm the other like my if I'm talking about myself, then yeah, I want to give it everything I got. But when I look at some of these athletes, when I look at their legacy, when I look at, you know, their aura, you gotta understand Michael Jordan retired twice on top, and then the last retirement was the last retirement after the Wizards, but he retired twice on top. And what led after those retirements is what if, what if, what if? That drives a lot for a player like Michael Jordan because instead of people saying, hey, you left at the right time, instead they're like, man, we want you back, Mike. We need you, baby. Come on, man. Come on back. You know what I'm saying? And then he was able to – I ain't going to say he tried to prove a point, but he was able to prove a point. If everyone thought that he was overhyped and he wasn't as good as he was and that he was just, you know, a normal player – well, look at what the Bulls did when he was gone for that year and, and, and some change. The first retirement, he showed that, listen, I'm, at, I'm, I'm good as advertised. So it is what it is. And then he come back, he wins three more. And then in 1998, he has the even bigger clout than the first time of what if? What if they would have came back for one year? Like I say, I, I equate this to Barry Sanders. Barry Sanders was running all over the NFL, one of the most elusive, elusive running backs ever in NFL history. And he just retired out of nowhere. And people was like, wait, what? Why would he do that? Barry, come back. You're young. You're in your prime. Why would you leave now? And it, it left you with the big, what if Barry would have stayed? What if Barry would have played more? He would be the all-time Russian leader. Or he'll be the all-time this, all-time that. So for Michael... I, I'm 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 a big component of leave when you're on top. Why wait, embarrass yourself, go out the wrong way, and then people you give them something else to talk about. If Jordan didn't come back in those Washington Wizard days, what would we, like you would have very little negative things to say about him. But he did come back, 
because the what if got to him. And he, he, oh, I got something else left in the tank. Let me come back. And then those wizard days was totally opposite of those bulls days. And now he has to live with that on his resume that he did that. Had he stayed away, he would have just been this mythic god in the game of basketball that we know him as. But he came back. So I, I, I don't have a problem with you leaving at, at the tip top and, and leaving us as fans, as media, to say, what if? 